Welcome everyone. Um, we're so glad to have you here for our webinar. We're going to give people a few more minutes to join, um, but we'll get started shortly. Thank you. Welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. I had a few comments that you couldn't hear, but we were waiting for some folks to join, but we'll go ahead and jump in. Um, on behalf of the team at Amplify, I want to welcome you to the webinar this afternoon. We're so happy that you could join us today for another installment in our webinar series on applying the science of reading in the classroom. Um, today, we're going to focus on assessment. So a few housekeeping things um, before we get started. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be emailed to all who registered. So if you have to leave early or if you have friends that registered but couldn't join, um, you will get a recording emailed to you. Um, if you're having technical difficulties, you can let us know in the questions panel. Um, we have found that sometimes you just need to restart the Zoom application if you're having difficulty. Um, we'll also take questions throughout, but we'll answer them at the end. So throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, you can send them into the questions panel at any time, and then we'll answer them at the end. All right, so before we really jump in, I just want to introduce myself um, so we can get to know each other. Um, I'm Danielle D'Amico, a learning scientist with Amplify. I've been with Amplify since 2013 and have worked across our early literacy assessments and instructional programs. Um, at Amplify, we are research and data driven and really focused on impact. Um, so as a learning scientist, I bring a research and science of reading perspective as we develop our products and services and ensure they're aligned with effective approaches from the research literature and from real classroom practice. I also lead many of the studies that we conduct to validate our assess assessments and instructional tools and uh, make sure we're using our results so that we're having a strong positive impact on student learning and also learning from our results and improving our products and services along the way. Um, just a little bit more on my background. Um, I am trained as a school psychologist and special educator 
I've worked in schools in Illinois, Oregon, California, Nebraska, and New Jersey um, as a teacher aide, a school psychologist, a statewide um, response to intervention and multi-tiered systems of support trainer and professor. And I also ran an assessment and intervention center where we evaluated students in kindergarten through um, 12th grade and provided literacy interventions. So assessment and using assessment to drive instruction um, is at the heart of all of the work that I've done. And I've had an amazing opportunity to work with so many um, partners in different districts across the country as they set up good, strong systems of literacy support to have the right impact on their students. So I'm drawing on those experiences um, as I share with you today. All right, so these are um, the questions I hope that we're going to answer together today. Um, when we talk about the science of reading, we're often focused on instruction and intervention, but today we really wanted to spend some time talking about assessment in a science of reading context. Um, we wanna talk about where does assessment and data fit within a comprehensive literacy system? We wanna talk about what types of assessments are needed in an effective literacy system the characteristics of high quality assessments and how to use data to drive instruction. So hopefully we'll dig into these questions and answer some of them together today. So as an educator, and especially if you've participated in other sessions and conversations on the science of reading, you've probably seen a graphic like this before. Um, this is a depiction of the simple view of reading which can help us understand what is actually a really complex combination of skills that are required for, for students to be able to read. It's kind of funny to call reading simple, um, but this, this um, theoretical model really helps us to think about how we learn to read in a clear and focused way. Um, what this is really saying is that in order to get meaning from text or to be a proficient reader, you need to have skills in two areas. You need to be able to decode the words into speech, and you also need, need to be able to understand language. So we need to build all the skills necessary to read words automatically, and we also need to build all the skills necessary to understand our language, which is, starts with oral language from day one. Um, so we want to be clear that reading is not simple. Um, it doesn't happen naturally, and not all stu students learn to do it at the same pace but skills in both of these areas must be acquired by most by all students and most students need some good direct and explicit instruction to acquire the skills in these areas and become proficient readers. If you want more details on this model, um, we had an earlier webinar with Susan Lambert and she goes into a lot more detail, but we've just covered the basics here. So, and here's another visual you're probably familiar with, maybe not in exactly this form, but I'm sure you've seen um, the Scarborough braid or the Scarborough rope before. Um, this is a more detailed picture of the skills required in those two areas of word recognition and language comprehension. Um, so this illustrates the simple view a little more deeply and also shows how our skills maybe start isolated and they weave together um, to, so that we can become more strategic and automatic readers. So that's sort of the heart of what the science of reading is telling us. Um, so what does this mean for assessment and instruction? So we're gonna talk about what it means to have a comprehensive literacy program. Um, in order to ensure that all students are learning to read, we need to set up a complete and comprehensive literacy system. Um, it's really important for us to not think about different children and programs and uh, supports in isolation, but to carefully plan a full continuum of support so that we can be sure we have the instructional approaches and tools and um, interventions that we, that we need to match the needs of all learners. So within a comprehensive literacy system, we have core instruction, the instruction we provide to all students. We have differentiated instruction and practice. This is where we're targeting the specific needs of all of our learners because we know not one size fits all and that all of our students are going to need some differentiation um, at some point or another. And we also need to have interventions in place for our students who may demonstrate risk for difficulty or may be truly struggling and in need of more intensive intervention. 
Um, so those are those instructional pieces, that instructional continuum that we need to have in place for all of our students. Um, in order for these supports to really be effective, they need to meet some um, criteria. They should be evidence-based. They really need to be aligned, meaning they should work together. So we wanna have you know, core instruction and differentiated instruction and interventions that are all linked in some way. Maybe they use similar terminology. They take a similar approach to teaching the skills. Um, we want them all to be really tightly aligned. Um, and most importantly, they should the instructional supports we have have to be matched to the needs of the students. So in order for all of this to be possible, we of course need that data to drive our instructional approaches for our students. Data help us to ensure that the programs and practices we put into place are working, they help us make sure they're aligned to a common goal, and they help us identify the specific needs of the students so we can be sure we're matching our instruction um, to the needs. So in short, having data is going to improve the accuracy of our instructional planning. It's going to help us focus on outcomes and ha always have student um, impact and student performance in mind. Um, it's going to help increase communication and collaboration amongst all the educators. Um, when, I have, when we have a common system of data, we can talk really clearly about each student, who's at risk, who's not at risk, what specific strengths and needs are. Um, so it helps to provide that language um, among, edu among educators. And it also, of course, provides us feedback. It helps us figure out what approaches are working, um, what aren't, and where we should go next. So data is really, really key. And I just want to just take a moment and say, you know, this is what it's all about and why we need data so urgently um, to help inform our literacy systems. Um, we know that it becomes harder and harder to catch students up to where they need to be if they're struggling. Um, what we're seeing here are the reading trajectories of two groups of students. The lowest 10% is in red and the middle 10% is in green. And this is from a large sample of students um, from across the country. And what we can see here is these groups started pretty similarly, and that gap between them gets larger and larger over time. I know we've all probably experienced this in schools and it goes without saying, but it's really um, powerful to take a look at this vis visual. Um, so we want to make sure we're setting up a system where we're supporting all students and getting them on track as early as possible. So prevention and early intervention are the name of the game. And to do that, we need to have a strong system of instruction that's driven by our data so we can identify students early and close these gaps as soon as possible and better yet, prevent them from ever even happening. All right. So there's so many assessments um, that are available in the world and they all serve so many different purposes. So it's really critical as you're thinking about data and the assessments that you're using to make sure you have assessments that are designed for the purpose that you're using them for. So you wanna be sure that the data that you have can act are actually equipped and designed to answer the questions you're trying to answer. So let's just go through these um, quickly, the different types of or purposes of assessment in a, in a literacy system. You have your screeners, sometimes people will call them um, benchmark assessments, but these provide information about which students are meeting or exceeding expectations and which students are at risk. So these are the assessments that we do with all of, all of our students to see who's on track and who's not and who may need additional supports. Diagnostic assessments, and by a diagnostic here, I mean skill diagnostic. These are the assessments that provide in-depth information about a student's skills and instructional needs. And sometimes this diag diagnostic assessment is a separate assessment. Sometimes it might be just deeper analysis of your screening data that can get you to a point where you have more specifics about student needs. Um, next, we have progress monitors and mastery monitoring assessments. Um, so these are the assessments that provide us information about our students' learning. So those progress monitoring assessments um, tell us if students are making adequate progress, if our interventions are effectively meeting their needs and getting them to import, reach important outcomes. Whereas our mastery monitoring assessments will provide us information on are the students learning these specific skills that I just taught? 
So the mastery monitoring assi um, assessments will be really tightly aligned to your curriculum, where your progress monitoring assessments are typically going to be more um, more separate from your curriculum and looking at our students on a trajectory toward learning to read. And finally, we have our outcome measures. These are that bottom line evaluation of the effectiveness of your program. Things like state assessments um, would fall into this category. All right, so we've talked a little bit about assessments. So let's talk about how these different assessment types fit within our literacy system. So for core instruction, we'll focus there right now. So on the dark orange and that medium orange um, portions of the square, um, we need data to determine the overall health of our system, to plan our small group instruction. And by that, we mean to figure out how to group students and determine which skills to target in those groups. And we need to actually identify the skills where students may benefit from some help with individualized practice. So that, those are key ways that we need to use data in our core and differentiated instruction and practice. So in terms of our types of assessment, our screening tools help us determine the overall health of the system. They help us answer questions like, what percentages of my students are meeting important goals? Are my students who are meeting my expectations staying there? Am I maintaining um, their success over time? Um, we also wanna ask our screening data to tell us if I'm able to accelerate the progress of students who are below expectations, and we can take a look at it to the data to figure out which programs are working well, um, which aren't, and maybe I want to reconsider um, implementation of them. And then screening tools and skill diagnostic assessments. And like I said, that can sometimes be um, just deeper analysis of your screening data, can also help us determine how to group students for differ differentiated instruction, and which skills to target. Um, so that was a quick snapshot of how we can use data um, to drive our core instruction. And it's really, really critical to have strong data for this part of our system. Um, like I mentioned before, we really wanna focus on prevention and setting up success for all students um, as early as possible. So focusing on that core instruction is, is really key. Oops. So let's talk just a minute about using um, data for more intervention type decisions. Um, so we also need data to identify our um, risk or need for intervention, what skills to target in those interventions. And we also need to, of course, monitor pro progress to ensure that our instruction and intervention for these students who are at risk and in need of support is really having the impact um, that we need it to have. All right, so that was a lot. We covered a whole literacy system and different ways that we can use assessments and data to drive our system. Um, so let's take a minute and give, give you all a chance to really think about the assessments that you have in your system. Um, list your assessments. You can just write, jot it down on a piece of scratch paper. Um, indicate what purpose they serve or what type of assessment they are um, and the skills that they measure. And, and think to yourself, you know, do you have all the tools that you need? Are you using the assessments for their intended purpose? Um, are there some assessments that you have that you're using that you feel like aren't really driving any of your instruction that you may not need? And then uh, maybe create some action items for yourself. Um, are there some assessments you want to get more information on? Or is there a type of assessment you think you might be missing and you want to start talking about this with your team? Um, so go ahead and we'll give you a good few minutes um, to just jot down some notes.
All right. I hope you had some time to really think through all of your assessments and identify you know, what's working really well for you or where you may have more questions or want to dig deeper. Um, and we'll revisit your list um, as we go uh, through some other items throughout the webinar. All right. So what are characteristics of high quality assessments? Um, there are so many assessments out in the world. And of course, they all claim to be the best and the most instructionally relevant and the highest quality and all of those good things. Um, but it's really important to be critical of the assessments that are available and the assessments that you're already using to make sure that you're going to get the information that you need to really drive um, student outcomes. So as you think about the assessments you already have, or if you're thinking about selecting new assessments for your comprehensive literacy system, um, these are three areas that you'd want to consider. Um, first, you want to consider that your assessments are aligned to critical skills that are required for successful reading. Um, as we think back to the science of reading and the simple view of reading, you know, we want to make sure we have a full set of assessments that address our word recognition skills, as well as our language comprehension skills, so that we can be sure we're getting that real comprehensive picture of student development over time. We also, as we're thinking about being aligned to critical skills, want to make sure that the tasks included are good representations of those skills, meaning are they really authentic tasks that are truly representative what a st uh, student should be able to do in that domain. And we'll dig into that in a minute. Um, you also want to make sure your assessments are developmentally appropriate. They should measure the right skills at the right times and they should use methods that make sense for where a student is in their overall development and in terms of their literacy development. And we'll dig into that some more too. And it's also essential that the assessments that you use are technically sound. And what we mean here is that you want to know that the right research has been conducted to show that the assessment produces accurate and meaningful results that you, so that you can be confident in the data that you're receiving and the instructional decisions that you're making. So let's dig into these three areas a little bit more. So the first is aligned to critical skills and at the right level of granularity. So thinking back to our simple view of reading, there are so many skills that students need to learn to become successful readers, um, but they generally fit into the areas of word recognition and language comprehension. But we can break that down a little bit more um, to look at how different skills that fall into those two major areas. Um, these are pro probably really familiar to you as the, those big ideas of reading. So in terms of word recognition, we have phonics and phonemic awareness and moving to fluency. And then for language comprehension, we have comprehension and vocabulary. So this is one critical piece to consider as you select your assessments. Are they aligned with these big ideas or the skills the science of reading has indicated are important for reading success? And as I mentioned, one thing that you also want to keep in mind here is the level of granularity that you need to assess these skills. So as we think back to our purposes of assessment, if you're conducting screening assessments, you don't need to assess all possible um, skills that fall under that umbrella of phonological awareness or phonics or vocabulary. Um, you really need to think about what are the key indicator skills that are going to give me that quick snapshot of is, this, is my student um, successful or in need of additional instructional support in an area. So we don't need to get super detailed with our screening assessments. Whereas if you're really trying to plan your instruction um, and you need some more specifics in terms of figuring out how to target students' um, interventions, you might want to get a lot more specific with your assessment and really break down phonological awareness into all of its component parts. So as you're thinking about, are my assessments aligned to the critical skills, also be thinking about whether um, you know, they're at the right grain size. Or am I getting enough detail or is it just so much detail that I'm not going to know what to do with the results at the end of the day? Um, so we're going to now take a look at different tasks for assessing these critical literacy skills. We're gonna focus on the tasks that have the most research to support them as good overall indicators of a domain. So we're gonna think about that larger grain size. Um, and we're also going to focus on tasks that look a lot like the skills we're going to teach, meaning that they're pretty 
authentic reading behaviors. So focusing on tasks that are you know, really authentic, highly aligned with instruction is going to help us to be able to e more easily link our results to our instruction. So here are some examples of phonological awareness tasks. Um, asking students things like, what's the far first part of pancake? And the student has to respond, pan. Or tell me all the sounds you hear in the word cat. And they have to segment by phonemes, k, a, t. So this, those are some really basic phonological awareness tasks um, that are strong indicators and predictors of students' skills in that area. Um, uh, some word decoding and word recognition tasks oftentimes are things like reading make-believe words or reading real words. Um, a lot of times we get questions about why make-believe words and make-believe words work really well because um, we students can't come with any sight word knowledge or any memory of what this word looks like. They've never seen it before and they actually really have to apply those word recognition, those sounding out skills to be able to read that word successfully. So it's a really good, um, good way to get an insight into where students are in terms of their phonics or decoding skills. But we also want to look at reading real words um, in isolation. We want to make sure that we're not always assessing real words in text because if they're in text, students have a lot of context to help them, you know, sort of, you know, reason out what the word might be. Whereas if we're looking at them in isolation, we get that, you know, clear indicator of can they just read these words. Um, let's also go over some fluency. I, I only have one task here because this is kind of the, the gold standard where it comes to assessing fluency skills. It's just having students read a passage out loud for a minute. Um, there's decades and decades of research showing that this is a really good indicator, not only of students' fluency skills, but of their overall reading skills. Um, now we're going to jump to vocabulary, and vocabulary is not as straightforward as our um, word recognition skills. Vocabulary is just not very easy to assess. Um, so there are lots of things to consider as you're looking at your vocabulary assessments. Um, one is um, making sure the assessment assesses the right words. Um, we want to make sure we're assessing what I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, um, tier two words. So those words that are high utility, often encountered during reading, and likely to be related to concepts that children understand and aren't typically learned just as part of conversational language. So we want to be able to assess words of that type. We also want to consider whether we want to be assessing more content specific words um, and also want to consider uh, the alignment of the assessment with, with stu what students are actually being taught. Um, so which words are included in the assessment is important, but also the tasks that are included. And again, this is where I say it's really hard to get a good strong measure of vocabulary, but these are tasks that um, we're finding work really well um, for getting that general indicator of students' vocabulary knowledge. So just traditional fill in the blank questions and then um, other uh, measures which are ask students questions about a word. So if you resolved a problem, is it still there? If you know a word, do you understand it? Um, so just different ways to put words into context. And these types of um, tasks are starting to get at not just do students have surface level knowledge of the word, but do they have that deeper knowledge of words? And what we know from the research is that um, having deep knowledge of words is more related to word reading and comprehension than just having that surface level knowledge. So comprehension is another skill that's not so easy to assess. Um, one thing that's really important to note, as I mentioned, is that especially in the early grades, um, fluency is a really strong indicator of students' overall comprehension. Um, you know, what we know is students need to sound out, students who need to sound out words and who aren't fluent don't have those cognitive resources to focus on making meaning of what they're reading. So that's why we see fluency over and over again be a really good general indicator of students' comprehension skills. 
Um, another way to uh, assess comprehension is through a maze or a closed task. This is where students read passages and have to um, circle answers that fill in the blank. Again, another really key indicator of overall comprehension skills. Because again, we're at that high level grain, you know, high level of, you know, do my students have overall comprehension or are they at risk? And then there are, of course, you know, tradition, more traditional approaches like reading passages and responding to questions um, all work really well for assessing comprehension. Um, we also wanted to mention, and we could have um, webinar upon webinar on just this topic and, and have and have some planned, um, but wanting to make sure that the assessments that you have are aligned to key indicators of dyslexia risk. Uh, many states are starting to pass legislation that requires dyslexia screening. And this legislation typically um, indicates which skills should be assessed. Um, the majority of the states are focused on those skills that are key indicators of dyslexia risk, which are shown here, um, phonological awareness, alphabetic principle, a word reading and rapid automatized naming as the hallmark of dyslexia is word reading difficulty. Um, states do often also include skills that might not be the key indicators of dyslexia, but are consequences of dyslexia or word reading difficulty. So this, you know, vocabulary and comprehension as well, so that they, you know, schools have a full and complete picture of students' overall literacy skills. So we just wanted to mention, you know, making sure that um, you're also considering the alignment of your assessments to those key indicators of dyslexia risks. That's so critical. All right, so let's just pause for a minute. We've talked about making sure your assessments are aligned to the critical um, reading skills. So go ahead, just for a second, go back to your list and think about you know, what skills you're already assessing and if you feel like the tasks that you're using are aligned to those skills, um, really good, solid, authentic uh, reading behaviors that can easily be, link be linked to your instruction. Okay, so we've talked about alignment to critical skills. Let's now talk about developmental appropriateness. It's so important that the tasks we're using to assess students are matched to the developmental stage of a child. Um, we know that very young children have difficulty sustaining attention and can be easily distracted and aren't necessarily motivated to sit quietly by themselves and complete tasks independently without a lot of encouragement. So that's really important to consider as you're assessing your students because you want to make sure um, the data that you're getting are actually reflective of what the students really can and cannot do. Um, even more importantly, we also need to think about where students are in terms of learning to read. Um, so it isn't enough to assess the right skills. We also want to assess them at the right times and in ways that match where they are on that trajectory of learning to read. Um, one, one important thing to consider is that our young students are really focused on learning skills like phonological awareness and phonics to build up that word recognition the area. Um, and our assessments should really reflect that. And those are skills that require students to make sounds and read words. So it's really important that our tasks match that as well. So let's take a look at a, an assessment that really kind of shows this point um, of making sure that our assessments are really aligned to where students are developmentally as they're learning to read and allow us to get that in the moment snapshot of, you know, students actually reading words and, and producing sounds. Again, Bobby was on his way home from school one day. On his walk, he saw something green in the snow. He stopped and started and stared. 
He thought he was seeing blue screen in the snow. In the snow. It could be what it seemed to be, could it? He bent down in the snow and quickly dug it out. It was five, it was a five dollar bill. He carefully Okay. So just take a second and, and jot down all the things that you learned about this student's reading. Um, I learned that he's pretty automatic. Um, he didn't, his pacing was pretty good. Um, I learned that he is making some errors and I saw exactly where he's making errors. I also learned that he's able to self-correct some words as he comes across them. Um, I also, I didn't hear too much expression, um, but there was some there. So the point here is there's so much I can learn from listening to this student produce these sounds and read words and read connected text. And I also have a chance to get the information I need about his reading skills in the moment. Um, I can, you know, when I'm assessing, I can always go back to score reports and look at data, but I'm always gonna think back to this experience I had with the student and how I was able to hear exactly where his skills are. Um, I'm also able in this situation to keep a student on task. This student didn't need a lot of redirection or guidance, but um, I think we all know that not all students are that way. Um, but I, so I could be more confident that uh, he's engaged in the assessment. So not all assessments allow for these things. Many assessments that are completed online or include a lot of multiple choice questions don't allow us to actually hear students read or make those um, you know, in the moment impressions of student skills um, and, and know the specific errors that students are making. So, um, you know, it's really important to think about, you know, when students are learning those really early skills and it's really important for us to actually hear what they're doing that we have, have a means to do so. All right. So go ahead back to your list and think about your assessments and you know, are they developmentally appropriate, both in terms of just overall student development and then their development on that literacy trajectory. All right, last but certainly not least, we're going to talk about um, how to evaluate your assessments and determine if they're technically sound. Um, so in other words, we want to be sure our assessments give us accurate and meaningful data so that we can be confident in the decisions we make. We won't get too detailed here. This falls into another one of those. We could have many, many webinars and we've all taken many classes um, on how to evaluate assessments and different psychometric properties of assessments, but we just wanted to give some reminders about the things you, can, you should consider as you're reviewing and selecting assessments. Um, so we wanna think about reliability, and that's the consistency with which a tool classifies students from one administration to the next. A tool is reliable if it produces the same results when administering the test under different conditions at different times or using different forms or with different raters. So assessments should demonstrate, have demonstrated reliability and we often want to look for multiple forms of reliability. So internal consistency, inner rater reliability, test retest or alternate form. Um, we also want to look at assess the validity evidence that's provided for assessments, and that's the extent to which the tool accurately measures the underlying construct that it is intended to measure. So validity, validity is usually established by relating the results of an assessment to another assessment that's already in the field and has already been validated. Um, you've probably seen a graphic like this before. Um, assessments need to be both reliable and valid for you to get the information that you need. Um, it's really important to think about the purpose of the assessment as you're thinking about the technical properties of the assessment. Um, so for example, if you're making important screening and progress monitoring decisions, you're going to want to have assessments and results that that produce results that you know have really strong reliability and validity evidence. Um, a lot of places will cite things like, I want to see 0.8 in terms of reliability or 0.6 in terms of validity. Um, so again, when you're making those higher stakes decisions, it's really important to have really, you know, a lot of good evidence of reliability and validity. 
Whereas if you're making more of your, you know, just kind of mastery monitoring or skill diagnostic um, assessments, you know, to target instruction for your students, you may, you know, lighten your um, criteria a little bit um, because the decisions you're making aren't quite as, as high stakes. So it's really important to think about the purpose of the assessment as you're thinking about um, its technical properties. Um, other things to consider as you're evaluating assessments for their technical quality um, are the appropriateness of any cut points, um, especially when we're talking about screening. You know, we're using uh, the cut points that come with the assessments to make decisions about whether students are at risk or not. So we want to make sure the methods that were used were rigorous um, and the, that there is some indication that the assessment is accurately classifying students as at risk or not at risk. Um, we also want to make sure that the sample population used to validate the assessment or to set the cut points is really representative of the students that you're serving and of the national sample. And also, especially important for progress monitoring, you want to be sure the measure is actually sensitive to student learning. If you want to make decisions about are my students learning and growing, that measure should be able to pick up on that growth. And a lot of times um, our, our assessments don't pick up on that growth until much later um, than we want it to. So we have to make sure the measures are sensitive to change. Um, if you want to really dig in into um, different technical standards and how to evaluate assessments for their technical adequacy, the National Center on Intensive and Intervention, or NCII, is a great place to go. Um, here, they help explain some of these different properties of assessments, and they also have uh, a review of different assessments available um, for you to take a look at. So let's pause one more time and just think about what you know in terms of the assessments that you have and the technical data that you're aware of or where you might want to get more information. All right, so this likely goes without saying, but it's, I, I couldn't not say, and it's really worth emphasizing that it isn't enough to have strong assessments. Um, there have to be other tools, policies, and procedures in place to ensure that strong um, decision-making happens and is able to impact instruction for students. Um, we don't want to get to a place where we do all this amazing work and collect this great data, but aren't able to effectively use it um, because something else is getting in the way. So what are these things? We need some high quality reports and visual displays to help us really take in all the data and to help us make good decisions. We need to be trained in analyzing the data. So making sure we don't just know how to administer and score, we know what to do with all of the results that we're getting. And this one is so critical is actually having the time to devote to reviewing data, making decisions and implementing next steps. Um, like we talked about earlier, it's all about facilitating that comprehensive literacy system. So it isn't about, you know, just one teacher at a time looking at their data and making decisions. It's about thinking and working together to make sure um, we're planning that system effectively and meeting the needs of all of our students. All right, so we couldn't um, not try to talk a little bit about um, how do we actually use our data. So we talked about all the different types of decisions we need to make in a literacy system. Um, we talked about um, different assessments and how to select them. So we just want to take a minute to go a little more in, into detail on how you can use data for your small group differentiated instruction and for personalized practice, which we'll also go into a lot more detail on in later webinars. Um, and we're, we're focusing on these two areas because oftentimes these are areas where data are really important, but we don't necessarily always use them. Um, so this is just a little bit on key features of strong small group instruction and personalized practice. We want to make sure the instruction is direct and explicit. Um, it's systematic and sequential. 
So it's really following that um, trajectory of how students learn to read. We wanna make sure and there's a lot of immediate feedback incorporated for students and that we're teaching to mastery and align to student specific needs. So having the data to make sure that we're teaching to mastery and aligning to student needs is so, so key. And we have to have, we have, to have it in place for our small group instruction and our personalized practice to be successful. Um, as we discussed earlier, we need strong screening tools to help drive our small group instruction. Um, these tools can help us identify skill gaps, identify the strengths of students, um, put students in similar groups and adjust our groups often. I can't emphasize enough how important it is um, as we're providing small group differentiated instruction. Um, this is the place where we're adjusting often to make sure that we're continuing to close skill gaps and meet students' needs. Um, so this is just an example of um, some different groups. There are students with, that are set up um, along that continuum. So we have a group focused on phonemic awareness. We have a group focused on decoding. Um, these are all students with similar skills. We have a nice summary of the things that they can do and the things that they need to work on and then would have some uh, activities that would be aligned exactly to their um, data identified skill needs. And then finally, let's talk a little bit about the role of data in personalized practice. Um, we want to have data to identify where students need that practice and where to go next. Um, our screening data can also be used in this case to identify where a student might need some individualized independent support um, and to move them to the next target, targeted area. So that's just a little snapshot, a little you know, peek into using data to align your instruction. Um, but that's where we're going to wrap up. Um, and just to recap, um, we really wanted to hit home that we need good, strong data to drive our comprehensive literacy systems. Um, we hope you leave this webinar with some ideas about both the types of assessments you need, as well as how to use them successfully within your literacy system. Um, and, you know, really started to dig into these questions together. And I encourage you to use the table that we worked on uh, throughout the session to take some next steps in your, with your assessment systems. So I think now we're going to open it up to questions. Um, someone on the other side of this webinar <laughs> is going to feed me some of your questions. Um, so bear with us uh, as we make sure we're getting to them. I'm waiting for them to come through. So just in that time, let me just put a little plug in for the next set of webinars in the series. Um, we're going to do some on science reading and core instruction. Um, and then we'll take a look at the science of reading and some um, products that Amplify has available, both our core program, CKLA, Core Knowledge Language Arts, and our assessment and um, personalized practice. Supplemental Reading Program, M-Class, and Amplify Reading. We also have a podcast available. If you haven't listened to these um, podcasts, you are missing out. Um, they are um, filled with experts from across the field um, and just having really frank and open conversations about the science of reading. And okay, it looks like our questions came in. Let's see. Um, one question is, in what instances should mastery measurement be used? Because progress monitors should be general outcome measures, correct? So thank you. Yes, that's, you know, we're asking a little bit more about the distinction between progress monitoring measures and mastery monitoring measures. Um, yeah, mastery monitoring measures, oftentimes they're built, they may be built into a program, or you may have um, specific uh, assessment tasks that you have available of very specific skills that you want to see if students taught, whereas progress monitoring, we typically do think about as that general outcome measure or that look at our students overall on track to becoming a successful reader. So again, oral reading fluency is one of those key general outcome measures that we see 
in the field and that works well. It's that overall general indicator to our students on track. It's really sensitive to growth over time and it's really predictive of their overall reading performance. Um, let's see. You talked about dyslexia. Thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> I work with a number of at-risk students and constantly feel I'm catching them too late. Do you consider dyslexia screening in early grades a critical part of a science of reading aligned assessment? Absolutely. Um, we as a field of researchers and um, educators are learning more than ever before about what those key indicators of dyslexia are, how we can prevent students from going on and really having a lot of difficulty, and how to support students and provide instructional um, and provide the instruction that they need to really catch up and learn skills and, and you know, come up with ways to manage um, some of the difficulties that they're seeing. So absolutely, it is so critical to screen students early so that we can, um, you know, prevent any really big problems from happening and intervene early. Um, let's see, another question. Um, are there any good national outcome assessments that align to the science of reading? Um, you know, the, the NAEP assessment is kind of the assessment we think about when we think of overall outcomes assessments. Um, every state has a different outcome assessment. Um, it's really important, you know, to just use the indicators that we talked about today, the skills that are being assessed, um, the technical properties, um, the developmental appropriateness as you look at these assessments and determine, you know, how, how well they'll work for you and in your system. Um, let's see, do you have an example of a progress monitoring assessment that aligns to the science of reading? Yes, we do. Um, and we'll actually be having a webinar to discuss that assessment on February 13th with my colleague Jenny Zosky. Um, but we um, have an assessment called M-Class. It is um, the a version of Dibbles, the eighth edition. Um, and it's a highly um, validated really effective um, progress monitoring tool with decades and decades of research behind it. So I recommend that webinar if you're able to attend. Um, we have another question. Can supplemental student-led instruction serve as an intervention tool? Um, that's a really big question and I think it really depends on the quality of the program, um, the needs of the students and what goals you're really trying to achieve with that program. Um, oftentimes it might be that students need that supplemental support to get some independent practice and build skills in that area. And for some students that might be exactly what they need. Other students might really need some very specific teacher delivered um, highly focused intervention to, to be successful. Um, a lot of times what we see is that uh, some combination of having good supplemental um, practice for students along with an, um, a good intervention that's really explicit and teacher delivered is, is often the best combination. All right, I'm at the end of my list of questions, but I'll give it a minute. And while we're waiting, I didn't get to say before, we also have a face group, uh, face, <laughs> face group, a Facebook group on the science of reading, um, where we engage in lots of great conversation about the science of reading and share resources and things like that. So I would definitely encourage you to join that as well. And I'm not seeing any more questions come in. Oh, I'm just kidding. Okay, um, one more came in. What program or assessment was being used on the iPad for fluency in the video? Um, that was the M-Class Dibbles assessment that I mentioned and that we will be doing a webinar on. So 
Thank you so much for joining. Um, I hope this was, uh, you know, gave you some things to think about and that you can use what we discussed today to really think about the assessments that you have in place and um, help build that high quality data driven comprehensive literacy system. Thank you so much.